just so we can see it. Um, as far as kinetic friction, we have to know some of the equations we've used. Now, what might we start this problem with? How might we cause an object to move? Because it's kinetic friction, right? So we have to think about that. OK, so we need equations. We'll say a free body diagram from that. I agree. And then we have to either push or pull, or pull the cart. OK. Agreed. What else? What else? For kinetic. For kinetic, yep. Uh, Not yet? OK. Yeah. Are we just writing in mode? Yep. Just idea, idea, ideas about how we would perform a lab to calculate the kinetic coefficient of friction. I mean, being able to understand the kinetic friction is always the less static friction. OK, so that's a key idea. I like that idea. We'll write it down up here. Okay. The symbol should be familiar, right? Kinetic or uh, coefficient of friction, mu. Spence? Okay. So to make it easier for the kinetic part, what kind of a surface? Okay. I agree. I would use a horizontal surface for sure. What else? What else? What else? We have other sensors and stuff, right? So let's start talking about what else we'd have to use, what else we'd have to do. You want to measure the, I guess, the weight of the object first. Just want to find out the force. I would agree. That would be part of the way of getting normal force. You need the weight at least, right? At least the weight you would need. Depending upon what else we do, we might need something else. But we would need the weight of the object to get the normal force eventually. What else? We've got sensors, right? Think about the sensors. We've got sensors. How are we going to use them is the question, right? We've got either a force sensor or we've got a motion detector, a motion sensor. Max, what do you think? You can calculate it. So measure it or calculate it? I think measure, right? I mean, we could calculate it eventually, too. But our goal in this problem was to find mu, right? So in this case, let's say measure it, right? So measure the acceleration. Yeah, Spence? Uh, you can pull it with the force sensor. OK. If we wanted to use all of the material given, if we wanted to use all the material given, how about that? What else would we do? Chris? Don't you also need the force friction backwards? Say again? So the force of friction being applied backwards, that's going to be an interesting part, right? That's going to be interesting to think about. We're not going to be able to measure that, though, unfortunately, right? We can't, how can we, there's no way to measure the force of friction itself. Can't you measure the applied force? It's being equal to the constant velocity. Okay, so we can measure the acceleration, but ideally it would be nice to have this moving at a constant velocity. That would be ideal, so that you would have acceleration equal to zero. I agree. Why would it make things simpler? Because then we have a balance of forces, right? If acceleration is zero and it's moving at a constant velocity, then the applied force this way will equal the force of friction going the other way. So evaluate the force of friction from the applied force. So we got something pulling on it, right? It's moving at a constant velocity, then the friction pushing back has to be equal and opposite the pull that is feeling. So the pull, or the applied force we're calling it right now, the applied force should be equal to FF when it's at constant velocity. But if it weren't, we could still do it, right? We could definitely still do it. What would our equation of motion be in the x direction? What equation would we use in the x direction for this problem? What would be the governing equation, Chip? Yeah, F applied minus FF 
equals to max. And again, if we want to make things simpler on ourselves, we try to get it up and moving to a constant velocity so that this term goes to zero over here, right? Just so that it becomes zero. It makes life easier. But we can do it because we have a motion detector in this problem as well. So if you had me last year, we did something similar to this, if you recall, but we made sure it became a constant velocity because we didn't use the motion detectors also. But if we have a motion detector, we can get the acceleration at any moment in time. And then the, the, the LabQuest device will also record the force at any moment in time. And you can pick several moments in time. You can pick a moment in time where the acceleration is five, and maybe the applied force is seven. But then later the acceleration is two, and the applied force is only like three. You follow what I'm saying? So as long as we have enough data in this lab, if we have the applied force and we have the acceleration, well, we're going to know the mass because as we said, we're going to measure it. We put measure the weight of the object, but We'll measure the mass on a scale and then get the weight from that. So we'll have all the information except for FF. So this is where we're kind of leading into today's lesson. What is FF? What is it as a formula? And why is it that formula? Not just what is it, but why is it what it is? Think back to last year about your formulas for FF. Same two. Anybody else got this one? I'm happy for those two to go. But anyone remember the formula for force and friction from last year? No negative, but yes. The negative comes from the free body diagram. Very good. So it's a function of, go ahead. Which is rated as what? Good. So the harder you push down on an object, or the more weight pushing down, increases the force downward, and Spence is saying that increases Fn. So Fn is directly related to FF, and mu is as well. Remember, mu is the adhesive forces between these two non-similar surfaces, right? It's literally what's called, I was reading, so I was reading last night about this idea a little more deep, deeply than I've ever taught it. It, it. The scientists like to think of it as what's called cold welding, where like two objects with enough force applied to them actually stick together. And you felt that before, if you've ever tried to move something that's been in place for say five, six years, like say you're helping your parents move a couch or a table, something that hasn't moved at all, maybe it's on like a tile surface. What you'll notice is that you have to like overcome like a stickiness to it. And it's physically stuck together. Uh, and the book describes that as cold welding. And the idea behind it is that you have all these ridges on a microscopic level. And where those ridges are in contact, you get this adhesive force or this adhesive attraction uh, between the, the, the surface bonds. And what you do is you overcome that by getting through that little stickiness. And then after that, what's happening? After that, you're moving it, and you're still having all these little ridges contact each other. Those ridges that are contacting each other while it's moving, that's our kinetic friction right there. That's our kinetic friction. Static friction is the first part, is over, overcoming that initial the initial nudge you have to give it to get it moving. So yeah, these are the two things that matter, mu and fn. Mu is a function of two surfaces. If you didn't know that, you should write that down. It's not like density. Density is an object's material property. Mu is not any given surface's material property. It is a relationship between two surfaces. Maybe, you know, maybe it's uh, metal on metal. Maybe it's metal on ice. Maybe it's Teflon on metal. Maybe it's this lab table on your skin, literally, as you do this with your hand. But you need two surfaces because without the second surface being known, how are you going to give a value of mu for one surface? Again, it's the react, it's the, it's the, it's the, I guess reaction is the right word. It's the resistance to motion, right? The resistance to motion based on those two surfaces themselves. Yeah. So that's a really great question, actually. I never thought about that. So if you add a fluid or some sort of like a, a lubricant in this case, yeah. Air. Air, yep. Water, air, oil, absolutely, it changes it. When what's happening, though, is that lubricant is changing the mu of those surfaces 
Right. So it's kind of like a third surface. You can think of it that way, sure. So you could say like, um, you could say like a, a crankshaft turning or a lubricated crankshaft turning. They'll definitely have different new values and there'll definitely be different resistances in them. That, absolutely. See what he's getting at there? So you're technically like adding a third surface. How would you think of that? You wouldn't think of it as three surfaces. You would say a lubricated version of those two surfaces. And then you would remeasure the mu value. Remember, mu is all determined experimentally. Mu is not something that can be measured simply with equations right off the bat. You have to actually do it experimentally. So all the mu values that are in tables in your textbook, those were measured by somebody doing exactly what we're doing here, but at a very, very, very precise level. Applying a force, getting constant motion, and then seeing that, oh, you know what? These two things equal each other, F applied and FF. And again, that's if we're at a constant motion. M, sorry. Um, you sure? Yeah. Okay. So we can solve this equation for F apply or for FF, but recognizing that FF is mu FN. So really, we do need the vertical direction for this problem as well. We do need the vertical direction. And right now, the way we've got it set up is that we've got FN pushing up and FG pulling down, and that equals MAY. And that's going to go to zero for sure. I know that's going to go to zero because we're pulling on this. And in this case, we didn't specify yet, but we assume that the pull is horizontal right now. We assume the pull is horizontal, the applied force. Why would it make sense to make the applied force horizontal for the starting problem? Why do you think it would make sense, Chris? Because it makes it easier to find the Yeah, it makes it so much easier. I don't have to write F cosine theta in the X. I don't have to add in the F sine theta in the Y. Sure, could I pull on this like a sled? Like a sled, right, where it's at an angle, there's tension in a rope at an angle? I definitely could. But why do that in this problem? It makes more sense and it's simpler to make it a horizontal pull. Now, we didn't use the cord. It was the only piece I didn't use there. Why might a cord be involved here? Why might you not just attach the force sensor <coughs> directly to the car? What do you think? You could use that pulley system, maybe. You could use a pulley if you wanted. Not necessary, but you could. But why would a cord be useful, is what I'm asking. Is what I'm asking. Versus? Versus if it keeps us attached, it's probably harder to uh, pull it with constant velocity. Yeah, with consistent force or constant velocity, it's harder. And this is why, look, if you attach the force sensor directly to the cart, and there's like a little hook on the cart, that little hook on the force sensor might not always be in perfect contact with the actual cart until you actually really get it going. But having the cord there makes it a little bit easier because as soon as there's tension in the cord, it will start measuring that force directly. Is the cord actually necessary? No. But does it make it better results? Yes. Okay, do we get better results as a result of using the cord or adding it in? Um, so what would our free body diagram look like then? Here's our object. We've got the applied force. We've got friction pulling back. We've got the weight pulling down. And we've got the normal force pushing up. Okay, so there's our free body diagram right there. Our free body diagram again is what gave us the two equations we wrote down here at the bottom. Any questions on this idea for kinetic friction? Now let's say, I have a follow-up question for you. Let's say we start recording before we start pulling, right? So here's the object, this is calculator right here. We attach the rope to it. We hit start on the sensor or the detector, the motion detector device, the lamp press device, sorry. We start pulling on this and then it starts to move. What can you tell me about your results as a result of the way I just described the experiment? You start recording all of your data, force is plotting, acceleration is plotting, right, on the LabQuest device, and then you start pulling. Bridge, what are you thinking? The graph, like, it won't move for, like, the first few seconds. Yeah, it'll it won't move. move. And then it'll spike up. Okay. It won't move and it'll spike up. Um, Very good so far. Until it starts moving, you're measuring static friction. So, because we're looking at kinetic here, what should we do? You should start it after you start. Moving. Either start the collection of the data once it's already moving, or... As Bridge said, it's already going to be recorded before our data, so we ignore the beginning. What would this look like? Who remembers from last year? Or who remembers what this looks like? If I wanted to plot force applied over a function of time. Yeah? So it wouldn't be like an increasing linear function for a 
period of time, and then it's going to drop down dramatically and then plateau. And then plateau meaning steady, right? Yeah, Constant? Good. Steady. Yep, very good. Very good. That's our shape. This shape needs to be in your head at this point. This is the shape that you get every time you perform an experiment looking for friction. Why is that again? M already alluded to it, but Tristan, repeat it. Why is that? It takes more force to get out of being still. So you, you apply more force and once, once it's uh, kinetic friction, you need less, so it just stays that Yeah. Here's the kinetic region. And this is the maximum force of static friction right there. Absolutely right. And again, it takes a lot more, or not a lot more, it takes more force to get it moving than it does to keep it moving. So we're always going to see this type of a diagram. Yes, Spencer? Uh, in the case of the car, is it kinetic or static friction? For ro that's rolling friction. So we're going to get to rolling friction probably when we get to rotational stuff. We're not going to include it just yet. Uh, technically, rolling friction is static because it's pushing you off. It's like, remember what you're pushing with your shoes? That's static friction. So yeah, we're gonna say, unless you like hit the brakes and the wheels lock and you start sliding the car that glides, then it's kinetic friction because it's sliding. Another word for kinetic friction is sliding friction. That might be useful to write down. Okay, because if I talk about rolling friction or if we talk about rolling friction in general, we're not talking about standard kinetic friction or sliding. Okay. All right. This diagram should be familiar to you. You should have seen it at some point in time, whether it was in your textbook or in a lab or in your notes. The equation should be rather familiar as well. Um, anything else we need to do? What if, let me just pause, let me just pose this question. What if we did have an applied force at an angle? What if we were not able to pull on this object horizontally, but instead the applied force now looked like this on the free body diagram? Let's make believe the blue vector was the applied force. Chris, what are you thinking? Um, well, Fn would be less. Fn would be less. You hear that already? Notice what he picks up on already. Very good, Chris. Fn would be less for sure. Because now, if I see that blue vector, that blue vector has to break up into a vertical component and a horizontal component, right? So we still have the horizontal component, F applied. In this F applied now, in green, how would we get it, math-wise? How would I get the value of this vector right here in green, Matt? Uh, force and cosine this angle. Yeah, force, cosine, theta becomes my new F applied. So quickly, let's just jot down the new equations if we applied it at an angle. So if we're at an angle, let's put the equations down here. We've got F applied times cosine theta still minus FF equals MAX. That's the X direction now. So the X direction changes also, right? FF is now a little bit different because we're using F cosine theta. If it were applied at an angle. How about the Y direction? You had the idea, Chris, but I found you want to give us the Y? Yeah, the force of friction would be less because it would be less. But I'm saying the Y direction for now. So we have the X direction, the equation of motion, right? There's the X direction, we've got the pull, Minus friction oh, equals uh, MAX. Yeah. Uh, it'd be F sine theta. Okay. Minus F. Be careful. What else do you have there? What else? You said it a little while ago. Um, F applied. Uh, that's, yeah. that's F sine theta. That's okay. Force. Fn, yeah. The normal force is still, it's still there. The normal force is still there, actually. Remember, if I pull at an angle, Right? Unless I'm literally pulling up enough to counter the weight of the object, the normal force is still acting on it. So I can do this. I can pull on this iPad at an angle. But the desk is still supporting it, right? Everybody sees this? So I'm giving it a little bit of force upward and to the right. That's exactly what the diagram is seeing here. But the table is still supplying some of that upward force. If it weren't, what would happen? I would do this. Right? And now would there be any friction in the problem at all? So to do this kind of an experiment, there has to be contact between the surfaces. So I can't pull with enough force to literally lift it off the ground, which is why we know that MAY is going to be zero here. Remember, this is MAY, and I'm just setting it equal to zero for the y direction. Again, F sine theta is helping pull up. The normal force is also pulling up. The weight is pulling down. 
I saw their hands. Were there answers or other questions at all? Okay. So for this same experiment, to get static friction, what will we do? Same experiment. We just want static friction now. What do we do? Um, have the object still and you just measure until uh, the point right there at the uh, at Yeah. So measure and pull until it starts to move. move. And then what are you going to do from your graph? You're going to find the maximum value. So it's possible that you might get a plot of the, of the of the force as a function of time, you need to find its maximum value. How is calculus going to be involved there? Yeah, derivative, set equal to zero, right? So you would need to know what the function is, though, to do that. Most likely, you'd be given a graph of data, and you'd have to locate where the maximum value is. But if you were to be able to plot this and come up with some sort of a function that fit this curve, not necessarily an easy thing to do, but if you had a function that fit this curve here, or fit this graph, you could take its derivative set equal to zero and go ahead and find the maximum value which would give you the static friction force because it would be the max of that graph. Again, having that curve is not necessarily an easy thing to have. So you would probably be given that kind of a thing on a test. If it were the actual exam, maybe the multiple choice would say, the force of friction follows the following function. Determine when or determine the value of the coefficient of static friction. You'd have to find the maximum value of that force of friction curve to get the static friction force. And that'll give you this number right here. And then we have to divide by Fn to get our new value and we go to the solution. Okay, so in all of these problems, remember that we're really going to replace Ff with that formula up here. So when we actually do this, if we did it either at an angle or if we did it on flat surface, we have to replace Ff with mu Fn. And that's the only way we're going to be able to solve for mu. Chip, you had a question? Yeah, so I was going to ask if you should take the first derivative of the f uh, t or the second derivative. First, first, yeah. You want to maximize. Whenever you want to maximize, first derivative set equal to zero. Have you guys done optimization yet? Yeah. Are you starting now? Yeah. When you want to optimize, why is that weird that I said that? You're like, he's doing this. Um, we started it in Mr. Line or something, yeah. So optimization is about taking the derivative, set it equal to zero. Because either it'll give you a maximum or it'll give you a minimum. So if it's a cost problem in calculus, you're going to find the minimum. If it's a volume problem or a surface area problem, you might find the min or the max. Volume usually you try to maximize. In surface area, you try to usually minimize. Because surface area takes material. So when they say, find the surface area necessary to make a can of soda or a soda can with the following parameters, you want to minimize your surface area in that problem. So when you take this, when you start learning about this topic, you're going to talk about minimization or maximization. Here, maximization. So first derivative set equal to zero. Doesn't the second derivative quickly tell you whether or not it's going to be? Sure. Maximum. But you need the first derivative to locate the time t that gives you the location where the maximum will be. The second derivative test being negative means that the graph is concave down, right? When its second derivative is negative. So that means that the maximum occurs here. But if the second derivative tells you it's positive, it's concave up, which means it must be a minimum. Okay? But you're going to learn more about first derivative tests and increasing and decreasing functions to study that. But the second derivative helps you to see whether it's a min or a max. But to find the min or max, aka critical point, stationary point, have you used that phrase at all? Different than critical. Critical is when the derivative equals zero or when the derivative is undefined. Stationary points are just when the derivative equals zero. It's another terminology to use in college more. So a stationary point is either a max or a min. It's one of the two. It's got to be. But when you have a corner or a cusp in a graph, the derivative is undefined there. So you actually are not considering that what's called a stationary point. Stationary meaning there's no slope. The slope is equal to zero. So anyway, for these problems, yes, you would find the first derivative set it equal to zero. That would give you the time at which a min or a max occurs. It's not going to be a min for this graph. It's impossible for it to be a min, right? It'll be a max. And it's a global max in this problem, or an absolute max, not relative. I mean, technically, I always think of like absolute as the governing one, right? Because if I look at this on a small scale, this is definitely the absolute max. But maybe this went up later on for some reason, and then it becomes relative. But in this case, it would be absolute max. Um, okay, what else, what else do I want to do for this? All right, that's it for this idea of the intro lab. We're going to do a lab where we're going to calculate the static 
coefficient of friction. And we're going to do it using inclined planes. So we can see a little bit more math involved and see where this actually plays a role. Not the pull on the horizontal. That's an easy one. And I do that in junior year. And if you want to see that lab or go through that, you can absolutely come in and do that. And if you haven't done that lab, the one that we're talking about right now, I have all the apparatuses set up for it. So if you want to just play around with an experiment, see what the force detector gives you so you can physically see it, you can definitely do that. And I can send you a step-by-step -step lab on how to go through that process. Okay, but I'm not going to spend the time in class doing it. We spent today going over the idea. Okay. Um, let's see, anything else I want to mention here? No. All right, with that, I want to get into section 6.1. Okay, your test, if you keep in mind, is not until next week. Um, I have you guys today, and then on Thursday, we're going to finish 6.1 and start the lab on the inclined plane with static friction. And then next week, your test is pretty much chapter 5 and 6.1. Okay, and then following that, we'll start the next test material from 6.2 onward. That's going to be air resistance and drag force and then circular motion. So let's take a look at a problem here. Um, I actually saved the files this time, I think. Let's see where they are. Okay. So let's start with this problem first. Let me just give you guys the image of it as well. I realized I have the electronic version of the textbook. So I've been taking, remember, like pictures of the screen and it always comes out all wacky. I don't know why I didn't just do this. So I'm going to do this for more, more, more going forward. So this is from your textbook, the first sample problem. No, I'm saying like what, what's the difference between your screen shot and your screen text? Oh, it just looks much nicer. Remember, it has all the, remember the weird lines we kept seeing because I was yeah. taking a picture of the screen? Yeah, what's the, what's the, what I just screenshot it on my iPad. Oh. Yeah, yeah, because I have the electronic version. I'm like, oh, why am I doing this every time? It doesn't make sense to do that. That was my bad. Anyway, so this is from page, page 128. Okay, page 128. Um, again. What we just went over in that intro lab, in that set of your own lab, is everything that's in the text going up until this example. All about how friction works, all about the fact that it's two surfaces, that Fn clearly plays a role in the frictional force. So all of the theory that, we would have, that I would have discussed, kind of tried to incorporate into that design your own lab experiment there. Okay, so that's when I'm going to jump right into this problem now. So we have the following. The sample problem involves a tilted applied force. So this is pretty much the problem we just had, right? It really is, except now it's at an angle. And look, you might have trouble understanding and visualizing this, because you're like, wait, how can I put a rope there, right? How's that going to work? It's going to be in the floor? It doesn't make sense. Look at the diagram. It really doesn't make sense when I look at this. When I looked at it first, I'm like, that, that makes no sense. I'm, I'm attaching a rope to the end of this, which is then going through the surface, and then pulling on the rope down here. You see what I mean? So instead, how can I visualize this problem? Yes, it's getting pushed at an angle downward. I can transfer this force that I'm showing here. Look at the way I'm pushing this. I can make a diagram of this look like that. Right? So instead of that force being there, I could have redrawn this, or I can redraw this, and think of this force like this. Because that's all that's really happening here. Remember, we model objects right now as points in space. So it doesn't matter what part of the object the force is applied to, it's the angle and the direction that the force is applied to that matters. Yeah, and I know, trust me, that pushing down like this, watch, might cause the object to kick up, right? I'm going to push at an angle. And that's going to come to rotation, when we get to rotation of stuff. So we're going to have a lot of those point of space. That's, yeah. I feel like I saw your hand jump up, Max, and I'm like, I know what he's going to ask. Um, all right, so if we look at this problem here, what we want to do is we want to take a look at all the applied forces and see what's happening. So, first, the magnitude of the force applied is 12 newtons. The block's mass is 8 kilograms. I'm just reading the problem here. Uh, it's at a downward angle of 30 degrees. That's our angle theta. So I can go ahead and redraw theta up here now. Right, there's theta as well. I could also draw theta in the diagram up here. Right, that's theta as well. Remember, theta is going to be drawn in different spots sometimes. You've got to know how certain parallel to each other, so we have a corresponding angle there of theta. The coefficient of static friction is given, and the coefficient of kinetic friction is given. So the first question is, does the block begin to slide? So what are we really being asked? What are we really being asked in the first part of this problem? What do you think? Yeah. Is the net force equal to zero? Is the net force equal to zero? Close to it? Very close? I need you to be more specific than that. Is it 
Okay, you're getting closer. The reason I held back on the first one is because the net force can equal zero. I have to stop you moving, right? Yeah. Okay. Um, the force is applied in that extraction overcome. See the difference there? So, yes, eventually you want to see when the net force is not zero, therefore accelerating, right? Mm -hmm. But the general question I want to start with is, does F, F, does F applied in the x direction exceed the force of static friction? That's the question I want to ask and I want to pose here today. So the question becomes again, is F applied times the cosine of theta greater than the force of friction static? That's the question we're asking really. I'm not going to write that obviously, you know, but that's how I'm visualizing it. What is it in this problem? Yeah. Force of friction, remember, Chris, is always F. Yeah, but what's the static? What does static mean? Oh, static. static, static, static. Yeah, S is for static, K is for kinetic. Yeah. Sorry about that. S for static, K for kinetic. So if I draw a free body diagram of this object, I know that part of the force is pushing this way. I know that friction is pulling back right now until it starts to move. If it moves, it's static. I know that the weight of the object acts down. Normal force acts up. Is that it? Is that it? M? Very good. Remember, the applied force on this object is down and to the right. Look at the red vector, if you're not seeing that right here. Look at this vector f. It's pushing the object to the right, but it's technically pushing it down with part of its force, and that part is the component f sine theta. So that's my free body diagram. Again, the free body diagram is everything. Without the free body diagram, we can't do these problems. Now, obviously, you can visualize a lot of them. I mean, we did that with the lab a minute ago. With that lab setup, we didn't really need the free body diagram to understand what it was. So if you're taking an AB exam and you're doing a multiple choice problem and you really understand your stuff, you don't necessarily need the free body diagram for those because they're most likely going to be relatively simple problems. Everybody see what I'm getting at? But on a part two, you've got to have the free body diagram. You need, you must, you have to include it in your answer. You will get points for it, so take advantage. That's why in the quiz today, I gave you two points to start by giving the three-body diagrams, one for each diagram. And then you went into finding tension, and then you went into finding the angle B. Okay, but again, you'll get points for it, so get used to drawing it, even though on the multiple choice, you may not need to draw it. Because you know what? It does take time, right? And if you can visualize and not have to draw it, then you save yourself some time. But you need to be you know, really, really confident in your skills you're not going to draw the free body diagram on the multiple choice portions. There's another question with the free body diagram. So, because there's two forces going down, mm -hmm. is it general that you look put one and that next one up of it? I have a tendency to do this because I don't have two different colors to use. But your textbook and other books might lay them on top of each other and show them literally like that. Where they're, but it's the same concept. Or maybe even like right next to each other, like that. Your book actually does a diagram like that, but then it looks like they're at angles, you know what I mean? So I, I just don't like that way it looks. So if I had four forces, I would just stack them on top of each other like that. And that's acceptable. You can do that. I'm just giving you other ways to draw it that I think I can be more clear that way. see that by looking at the sum of the forces in the y direction and setting that equal to MAY. 
We've got Fn acting up. We've got F sine theta acting down. We've got Fg acting down, and that equals Mayy. Mayy is zero, so I can drop it off earlier on. And yes, as a result, Fn will equal F sine theta plus Fg. Well, what is Fg? Fg is always equal to Mg. That's something you have to have memorized by now. Okay, Fg is equal to Mg. So that is the normal force. Now, this problem doesn't ask us for the normal force, so this is not our final answer. But that is the normal force. Why do I know already that I'm going to need the normal force? How can I know that I definitely need the normal force? Very good. I like the way you worded that. Friction is a function of the normal force. Sorry, that should say Fn at the top right there. Fn, not just an N. At the very top right. Um, now, in the x direction, so that's the y direction, some of the forces in the x direction equals mAx. And remember, what do we want this object to do? We want the applied force times cosine theta just to exceed FFS, correct? We want it to just exceed it. So if I look at this problem and I start, I could say, all right, I've got F cosine theta pulling to the right. I've got FFS pulling left. That equals MAX. So what do I want A to be in this problem? What do I want A to be? Anything greater than or equal to zero. The instant A becomes 0.0001, it matters that it's going to move. Everybody see that right now? So we want this whole thing, this whole thing here, to be greater than zero, right? So when we want this object just to start moving, the instant it starts moving, we want the difference in these two values to be greater than zero, which is where our original statement came from in the beginning. Say it one more time. Yeah, if it were equal to zero still, it still wouldn't be moving. So we kind of want it to be that instant when it's just above zero. <clears throat> or it could be equal to zero for kinetic friction because constant velocity and acceleration is zero. So take a look when we get to, though. I want to point this out real quick before you guys go. The original statement we started with right here, remember? We said, when is the applied force going to be greater than static friction? We get the same result by thinking of it this way. If we want it to just start moving, just start moving. So just to reiterate, the final part we'd have to do here is we'd have to solve for mu. So this is going to become F cosine theta greater than or equal to mu times Fn. Okay? So we're looking at the static friction force. So again here, we're going to be solving for mu S. Okay, we're going to be solving for this. And in a problem like this, because they're asking us what is the mu S value, we could simplify things and just make an equal sign. But I want you guys to recognize what's physically happening here because we're actually solving for U.S. Here's my recommendation. Uh, I gave you guys uh, some homework assignment for multiple choice. Multiple choice for chapter five. That's due in two days when I see you again. Then you're going to have section six one homework due in three days. Okay, in three days, which is on Friday. I don't see you on Friday, though, but it's going to be due then. So keep track of this. I'd like you to finish this problem tonight, okay? So finish this problem as additional homework that's not listed. We'll do the rest of the solution for you. And next class, we'll start up with the next problem and go right into the lab, okay? All right, thank you guys. Have a good day. Thank you.